Welcome to Your College Bound Kid. A podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education where you meet people who will inspire you to be your best self. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent who is a little stuffy today because her sick child decided to sleep in her bed. (laughs) It is Thursday, December 12th, and welcome to episode number 98. Why EFC says you have to pay an outrageous amount of money. In this week's news, college admissions hysteria is not the norm. And we're in chapter 98 of 171 Answers. And we'll be talking about why the EFC can sometimes say that families need to pay an outrageous amount of money. And this week's question wants to know how boarding schools prepare kids for college. And Mark continues this interview with Miss Emily Griffin, the director of the Loeb Center for Career Exploration and Planning at Amherst College, and how you can evaluate and fully utilize a college's career center, part two. It's announcement time. And friends, I have to tell you, Anika sent me a text this week. She's like, can you talk right now? And, and she doesn't do that that often, <laughs> especially during the work day. So I'm like, uh-oh, what's going on? Is this bad news? Oh my God. You know, is there trouble? But as soon as I got on the phone with her, Anika was rhapsodizing. And I knew it was good news. Anika, share your news with our uh, listening family. So the oldest child, the firstborn, graduated from Davidson. He is now one of Emory University's finest graduate students. Yay! Woo-hoo! He's in the AA program, officially. And tell us what the AA program is. Well, uh, yep, anesthesiologist assistant. That is his long-term goal. And he worked hard. Mark, you know how hard that child worked. Yes, he did. (laughs) Why don't you tell us, is he basically took a gap year? Yeah, he got a job in New York, working within a school system, but he was taking that time to prepare for grad school. So, you know, he took the GRE three times, he he doing all this stuff. And uh, yeah, so he's got just a few more months in the big NY, and then he's coming on down to the ATL, or going on down to the ATL. He's coming back home, coming back to his birthplace (laughs) where he's from, Atlanta. Welcome aboard, Jalen. Mark, you know he was born in Greensboro, North Carolina. Oh, that's true. He was. But, <laughs> but for like he, a really he, short time. How long were you there he, before? But you know he claims Atlanta is home. Of course. I mean, when, <laughs> what, what, what were you, like three when you moved here? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's an Atlantan. <laughs> but we're happy to have him back at here. Mm-hmm. And at a fantastic, and that's such a great school for anything in health sciences. Congratulations, Jalen. Congratulations. So I have something, you know, we did thank yous last time for what we are thankful for. And one thing I wanted to say, and there's a little bit of a background story here, is my mother-in-law has been living with us. And I tell everybody, my mother-in-law is living with us. I'm like, really? Are you okay with that? (laughs) You know, how you feel about that? But I have such a cool mother-in-law. So I'm loving having the mother-in-law. She is here with us from Knoxville, Tennessee, at least for an extended period of time. So sweet. Coolest mother-in-law in the world. Shout out to Dorothea Brown. And I want to share an email that came in from one of our dedicated listeners, Tamara Weber, who is from Discovery Bay, California. She sent us a really, really cool email. And just so you know, don't be out there thinking, gee, if I send an email, they're going to read it on the air. <laughs> you know? So this, I'm going to read this to you all with her permission. But we got a lot of emails, but this one moved us. So this one's, once again, here's what it says. I have recently listened to episodes 7 to 12 for the first time, and I think it would help new listeners to know, grasp, or realize that you have a year of previous content that may coincide with the admission process for what they're going through as a student. I believe your material ages well, and it's always relevant, and perhaps new listeners may need a nudge or a reminder. As a fairly new listener, we are overwhelmed and filled with passion as we try to prepare our children for the most important choice of their lives, college. It just didn't dawn on me to ever go back and to listen to much older seasons until I started reading your book. I think it's because I had a disconnect and the themes you were discussing were perfectly timed with where I was in our college planning cycle. Great work. Say hello to Anika for me. And so I thought we would share that with everybody. That that, Yeah, our old episodes are just as relevant oftentimes, maybe even more, depending on uh, what you're going through. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything else? Any thoughts on that, Anika? No, I mean, that's an excellent point. And I figure it's like lifetime for us now. (laughs) 
a lifetime later <laughs> yeah. since we started. So yeah, I thank know. you for no, I really appreciate I her making that point. That is extremely important because I do from time to time meet people who are in that stage of the process. You know where we are. So you know that's clearly what our circle is right now. But yeah. Excellent. Well, and you know, we can look at our stats and we can see like the old episodes don't get like not even like maybe sometimes not even one twentieth mm-hmm. as many plays as the newer ones. Yep. And so I know that, you know, she's not alone in thinking, well, the old ones probably this is not a news show, right? You don't want to go back and look at the news in like 1977 <laughs> on a podcast. <laughs> our content is evergreen, as we say. Right. You know, one other thing, too, is don't use our titles to determine whether what the content is for the episode, because that, that's only one fifth of each segment. Right. So never want to assume we got new, new listeners all the time. So those are just a, a couple little tidbits we wanted to throw in there. Mm-hmm. Now, as we transition the admission tip for the week is that mission determines admission. Mission determines admission. And what I mean by mission is the mission statement. So for every school you are looking at, you need to know that mission statement and know it well because it will determine the priorities of the institution in terms of who they're looking for. That's all I'm going to say about that for now. But when I come back to the college spotlight, I'm going to pick back up on that theme. Admissions vernacular. The word of the day is pointy. Mm-hmm. You want to take a guess on that one? <laughs> I do pass. Pointy. <laughs> no? Okay. Pointy. So pointy is a term admissions officers use sometimes when they're speaking to groups, um, sometimes amongst each other. And it's sort of the opposite of well-rounded. So you can be well-rounded where you dabble a little bit in everything. You're like the Renaissance man, the Renaissance woman. You know, a little bit of sports, a little bit of arts, a little bit of community service, a little bit of leadership, or you can go deep and hard in one area, like kind of like Joy did, like AAU basketball from age 8 to 18. (laughs) Like how you said Janae was going to be hardcore track and all she was doing was track for a while, Mm -hmm. right? That's like a pointy applicant. Mm. So it's kind of like the opposite of well-rounded. Okay. Yeah. Now, is that in a negative context or is that just how they're looking at them? So you are kind of are who you are. This is really deep and I won't get too much into it. But I will say that highly selective colleges are looking for both well-rounded students and pointy applicants, but it's much easier to stand out as a pointy applicant Hmm. because they're more concerned with having a well-rounded class, right, you know? And so if they get someone like, you know, that's super passionate about a topic or a subject or a sport or an extracurricular, they love that because they know you'll bring that enthusiasm to the campus. But you kind of are who you are, and so they, they do look for a mixture of both, but it's harder to stand out if there's not sort of one thing that makes your application pop. Okay. All right. And the college spotlight of the day, we are going to Alabama for the first time and doing a deep dive in the University of Alabama at Birmingham, mm, UAB. That's my nephew went. Yay. Oh, good, good. Well, well you can chime in then. Well, maybe <laughs> you not. <can> ch- <laughs> <laughs> maybe he didn't go there. He's there. So I'm just joking, right? He got in, but he didn't go. He graduated. (laughs) Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right. The article this week, College Admissions Hysteria is Not the Norm. Um, This is found in The Atlantic. It is written by Miss Aaliyah Wong uh, a little earlier this year. And her subtitle reads, a focus on highly selective schools obscures the experience of the vast majority of American undergraduates. So Ms. Wong wrote this piece as a great reminder to us all that the majority of students are not facing the ultra stressful admissions process and trying to get into highly selective schools. And, of course, that dominates the media headlines. And, you know, she goes on and throughout and she outlines the low percentages of that population that's actually dealing with those issues But, Mark, although I did appreciate this article, Mm -hmm. I do wish that there was some acknowledgement of the fact that there is an absolute definite amount of stress that goes into the admissions process, regardless of the selectivity of the school. Mm -hmm. You know, she goes Mm -hmm. on to note, you know, HBCUs are not in the spotlight, but I just do feel like that there was, she very much downplayed how stressful the process still is for so many Mm -hmm. people that lack resources and education around the process especially within lower income communities, regard, again, regardless of the selectivity of the school. I don't know. I just feel like there was a, a huge void there in this. What do you think? Well, I think her main point of her argument is that the media 
fixates on how hard it is to get into Stanford and Harvard every year, and it gives an illusion that college is hard to get into and that most schools are actually not hard to get into. And it's something we've talked about before, but I want to, you know, in a second, share some statistics to back up her claim. And I think that point is very, very valid. I think that point can't be emphasized enough. And one way that I see this is when, you know, I'm working with a kid who's really academically strong and they get in their first college, I'm like, whew, I'm going to college. And I realize, wow, there was actually a doubt in them. They might get shut out everywhere. The media really has conveyed that notion for somebody to feel that way. But I do think your point is valid, that there are stressful aspects of the college process for everybody. There's stress over finances. There's stress over standardized testing. There's stress over essays. I would argue, Anika, that there's more stress in upwardly mobile communities than there is in low-income communities. Hmm. I feel like in upwardly mobile communities, there's just so much pressure to have to get into a brand name university for the parents to sort of maintain their social status in their social circles and for the student to be respected by their peers. And I find that that is most prevalent in affluent suburbs and in private schools. And in lower income communities, a lot of times you're just you're celebrated just for going off to college. But it's still a lot of stress. There's also the stress of the unknown. Like, what are they looking for? And, you know, like I said, test scores, essays, money, deadlines. Another area where there's a lot of stress is recommendations. And what if stuff's turned in late? And, oh, my teacher hasn't done my recommendation letter. Like, are they, you know, so deadlines. What aspect of stress were you referring to particularly? Well, and that's the thing. So, like, stress is relative, right? Right. You know, I can be rich and I can be stressful. I could be low income and I can be stressful. But I'm thinking about, okay, let's use Janae as an example. You know, we had our stressful moments Mm -hmm. still, right? Even with her banging out her SAT in her junior year, we were educated on the early action process. You know, we know how to go for the money and where it is. I mean, there are so many things that we were privy to that I know for a fact that is not the case for so many people. Mm-hmm. I mean, just the whole, you know, topic of procrastination, you know, among mm-hmm. kids and not understanding that they got to check their emails and follow these deadlines. I feel like in lower income for me, folks, I mean, I remember I go back to this one parent that I spoke with who didn't even know, he learned so late in the game what FAFSA was. Uh It was crazy. Like his daughter was up on, you know, high school graduation. He was just learning about FAFSA. Uh So, and he was darn, he was stressed out. Now, I don't want to, you know, say my stress is bigger than yours. But again, I don't want to downplay, you know, with people who who just lack general education about, yeah, I get it. You know, I get pressure about from my friends who want to go into this fancy thing. But that stress is, you know, I'm preaching to the choir to you, Mark. But I don't know. I just feel like there's still a downplay there. Yeah, I I think a lot of the stress for low-income families is around the money, the money part of college. And that's also a stress for middle-income families, too, because, you know, a lot of times they're aspiring to private schools with $60,000 to $80,000 cost of attendance uh, sticker prices, and they may be able to do 30 or 40 maybe, but we can't do 60, 70, or 80. So there's a lot of stress on the money with upwardly mobile families as well. You know, and another area where there's a lot of stress, and we're actually going to be talking about this on episode 100, there is a lot of stress around the the parent-child relationship and the tension mm-hmm. that yes. that's created because my child's about to blow this golden opportunity mm-hmm. by not doing what I feel they should do. Right. That's how the parent feels. And I've worked really, really, really hard to position them now to have a good opportunity. And they're about to fumble the ball on the one-yard line. Mm-hmm. So that's how the parent feels. And then the child feels like, I'm 18. Would you stop treating me like I'm 13? I got this. And mm-hmm. I'm going to be okay. And Maybe I don't write the essay exactly the way you want me to do, or maybe I'm cramming for my test prep at the last second, but everything's going to be okay. So there's definitely stress about that as well. So I think you bring a good point up, and you kind of went in a different direction than I thought you were going to go. I do want to share some statistics, though, that some of these are actually in the article and some of them are not in the article. I'll start by reading a quote from the article. I'll read portions of a quote. It says, various characteristics set these more typical institutions, meaning where most kids go, apart from their brand name counterparts, such as talking about where most kids go. Where most kids go to college, they're more likely to enroll Pell Grant recipients. They're more likely to go to college with non-traditional students who are 24 or older or, or who have children on their own. They're more likely to go to college with military veterans. 
they're less likely to consider research universities with large doctoral programs. They're more likely to go to commuter campuses. And according to Georgetown University researchers, a study uh, shows that, of all the country's four-year colleges, slightly more than half of them are private. Now, these schools that dominate the options for most high schoolers attending them is far more common an experience than that provided by the Dartmouths, the Dukes, and the Davidsons of the country. The landscape of higher education is far more sprawling than a focus on selective schools allows. So, you know, that, I like that quote because it kind of puts in perspective really the, the experience most people have. And then it shares the research done by Raj Chetty and his research team, which was breathtaking in college admissions. We've referred to this before. Roughly three dozen of the country's elite colleges, including Wash U, Trinity, Tufts, Yale, Brown, enroll more students from households in the top 1% of income, which was 630,000, than they do from the bottom 60%, which was like 65,000. In fact, here's a stat in the article. Students from the top 1% are 77 times more likely to attend an elite college than their peers are in the bottom 20%. That's crazy. So, like, you know, 77 times if you're on the top 1% versus the bottom 20% of income in terms of who gets in. Now, here's a little bit more stat, a little more data. So the national average is, acceptance rate is 67%. So the average school, two out of every three kids get in. And here's some admissions stats from some schools. St. John's University in New York, 67.7% get in. Virginia Tech, 70.1. Quinnipiac, 73.9. University of Missouri, Columbia, 78.2. George Mason, 81.3. Uh, fewer than 20% of colleges admit less than half of their applicants. And there are only 57 schools, and it's really closer to 50 when you remove some of the religious schools. Mm -hmm. Only about 50 schools in the country, Anika, that are accepting one in five. Hmm. It's only around 50. In fact, you know what? It's such a short list. I'll blow through it really fast. Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, Juilliard, Yale, Caltech, MIT, University of Chicago, Brown, Northwestern, Pomona, UPenn, Claremont McKenna, Dartmouth, Duke, Swarthmore, Naval Academy, Bowdoin, Military Academy, Vanderbilt, Cornell, Hopkins, Rice, Air Force Academy, Amherst, Colby, Pitzer, Coast Guard Academy, USC, Williams, Barnard, Harvey Mudd, UCLA, Colorado College, Georgetown Tufts, Merchant Marine Academy, UC Berkeley, Wash U, Cooper Union, Olin Collins of Engineering, Carnegie Mellon, Middlebury, Tulane, Wesley, and Bates, Notre Dame, Davidson, Emory, Haverford, and Northeastern. That is it. But here is a quote which kind of puts in perspective why there's so much stress. So this is a book from, you know, I like my book. I do believe my book is very, very helpful to people in college admissions. But in my opinion, the single best book on college admissions is called Admissions Matters. Mm. And we've done a recommended resource on that a long, long time ago. And so I tell people, if you're only going to get one book, like a comprehensive overview book on everything, it's the book Admissions Matters. I love that book. And here's a quote from Admissions Matters. Bill Mayer, college advisor, summarizes the problem this way. It's hard for kids to get in colleges because they only want to get into colleges that are hard to get into. That's deep. Did you catch that? It is. I did. <laughs> so in other words, those 50 schools that I mentioned, they represent only one and a half percent of the four-year schools right. in the country. But those are the ones everybody's clamoring to get in. Once again, I'm going to read this quote because I love it so much. Bill Mayer, it's hard for kids to get into colleges because they only want to get into colleges that are hard to get into. So what should our takeaway be, Anika? I don't know. Again, it was still a great article. I still get that. But to the point of there's still kids getting into all these other schools, are we not now acknowledging the fact that not everybody's trying to get into those selective schools? Or are we saying that all the kids are trying to get into selective schools, but they don't get in, so then they get into... Do you follow what I'm saying? I don't know. I feel like we're talking about this segment of people saying that that's not the norm, but we're trying to say that everybody's trying to do it. Yeah, I think really the what we haven't said here and we've said in other episodes is there's so many people that accomplish incredible things in their life that don't go to those schools. Right. So it's kind of insane for all this obsession with these one and a half percent of schools when the vast majority of people 
that do really, really well in life by whatever metrics you want to use, don't go to them. Mm-hmm. You know, so this it's insane. Now, by the way, I do want to say something. Nothing's wrong with aspiring for to a selective school. And if you're ambitious, that's probably something you should do if you're a strong student. Mm-hmm. And both of my kids have been at selective schools, and they both experience value from being at selective schools. I'm sure you've had conversations with Jalen about that, about Davidson. I know I've had conversations with Karis about the caliber of students that she's around. I see the caliber of her peer group. And Joy is interesting because Joy started out, she was going to play basketball, so she started out at a school that wasn't highly selective, ended up transferring, and she sees the difference. And I also don't want to diminish the fact that, you know, I know both of my kids said it feels good when people say to them, wow, you got into such and such school, like that kind of does make them feel good. So I don't want to diminish those things, Hmm. but I just want to underscore that, like, there is value to selectivity, there's value from the caliber of the kids around There's value to how a rising tide lifts all boats and it brings out the best in you. There's value to how it strengthens your network. But it's not required for people to have a great life. It's just not. And, you know, and there's so many things that are going to make a bigger difference in your life trajectory, such as your people skills, right? Mm -hmm. Your work ethic, you know, your grit, your personal integrity. Or how's this? Whether you're good at what you do. You know, right. there's so many people that don't go to selective schools. They're just really good at what they do. Yeah. So I just feel like this misplaced emphasis is creating this frenzy and it's a misplaced values. And I know we've talked about this a lot, but I like this article because I thought it kind of put it. I don't want people to think it's the norm. It's not the norm. There's only one and a half percent of kids in the country go into those schools. Right. I think we beat this one enough. I feel like we <laughs> beat it up like a drum. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, and Mark, and Mark yes. to me, it's like the article saying, OK, not everybody's doing this, but there's such an emphasis on it in the media. OK, yeah, the media is, is talking about it, but that's still not what everybody's doing. Does that make sense? Well, so here's what I'll say. Yes, the media is talking about it, but also a lot of kids are buying into the fact that they need to do it and their okay. parents are buying into the fact that they need to do it. So that's what's creating the frenzy. So we're talking about those wealthy people that are listening and reading these headlines? No, no. and I work with a lot of kids of all incomes that that feel like they need to get into one of those schools on that list. Mm. You know, they feel like they need to do it to, a lot of it, honestly, I find with students, I mean, just this week has come up multiple times in conversations I've had. One parent, you know, right now there's tension between the parent and the student because the student only wants to apply to certain schools that are kind of outside of how much the family wants to pay. They're not going to qualify for financial aid, but they don't want to pay 75000 And the student only wants to apply to certain schools because the kids in his peer group, they are applying to those schools, and he doesn't feel like he'll be successful in the eyes of his peers. People, there's a lot of research that shows once you turn 11, what your peers think of you matters more even than your parents. You know, it's a, mm-hmm. it's debated in research, but whether it's the parents or the peers, but the peers start to have significantly more influence. If you're coming from a peer group where there's sort of status is conferred on people based on where they go to college, and if you're going to go to a school where people are going to be like, oh, okay, you know, you'll still have a good life. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sure things will be well. Right. Or little comments people make, that impacts people. It impacts how they feel about themselves, whether they feel like they're successful. So, yeah, it's a small percentage of people that go, Mm -hmm. but it's a much, much larger percentage of people that not only are trying to go, trying is not the problem if you're a competitive applicant. Mm -hmm. It's feeling as if you're less than if it doesn't work out. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, but then, and again, I need to, I'm still wrapping my mind around it because the article is about, you know, hysteria is not the typical, like students aren't going crazy every day, like the media is projected. But again, to my takeaway from that article was that, dang, there's still a lot of stress out there. Like there is, I don't care, you know, yeah, they rich people have their stress, but we got our stress too. So don't say, oh, they're getting into these schools and they're good. No, we're not good. <laughs> you know, we're still dealing with a lot of stuff. So. Oh, you put yourself in the rich people camp now? No, no, no. I'm putting myself oh. in the poor people camp. That's what oh, I'm, that's my side. Out. Or <laughs> No, Stop that no, nonsense. but no, no. What I'm saying is, is that mm-hmm. she's hyping up the stress that rich people deal with trying to get into these schools. That's the way I took it. Right. Well, where did it say that this is 
it's only rich people that have that stress. Well, and because it's the top 1% of people and, you know, the rich people are the ones that are going to these schools where mm-hmm. the lower income people, they're getting into like the HBCUs mm-hmm. and, the, and the schools that take the, you know, the half percentage or whatever, you know, more than 50% of their applicants. I don't know. Clearly, I may have read right. a lot of. A lot of open enrollment schools and a lot of regional publics, mm-hmm. a lot of regional public schools, right? And maybe it's not even about the income. It's just about the where you are. Like maybe just your communities are different, right? I mean, you could be middle class and still not be wealthy, but you're still dealing with, I don't know. It, to me, it's just, mm, I just didn't get that sense of her acknowledging the fact that people that go to other schools are going through a stressful process, period. I see. Yeah. So you felt like she was saying if you're aspiring for highly selective schools, it's a stressful experience for you. Right. And if you're not, then, then you're not good. Stressful. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I didn't pick that up because to me, the point of the article was like, there are a lot of people that apply to one college. Mm-hmm. You know, do you know more people apply to one college than any other number of colleges? That's the most common number of schools that people apply to is one. No, I didn't know that. It's not the majority. It's not the majority apply to one, but it's the largest group. Like if you had a chart, how many apply to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Like right. the biggest group would be one, right? Right. And so, so she's saying there's another world out there where people are applying to a school. You know, they know that they're in, and I'm good. I'm Gucci, as you say. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I shouldn't have said low income or high income or whatever. It's just a matter of the type of school, right? If I'm applying to a regular school, it's still stressful. <laughs> Yeah, I I think you were looking for her to acknowledge that there's stress in the process for everybody. Right. And I think that wasn't the, I'm sure she would agree with that. I don't think that was the intent of her art, of what she was getting And I mean, and again, I appreciate it. You know, I get that hysteria that Mm -hmm. is projected through the media. But again, I feel like there's an opportunity because you're saying what they're not talking about, but you you should also say what they are, what they should be talking about. Like there's still- Yeah, it's not just the media. It's like, she was talking about the stress that people experience that are aspiring to get into the highly competitive schools. And she's saying, I just want people to know most people, that's the exception more than the norm. Mm, Yeah. And I think that's an important message because even when I, like if you listen to what I said, Anika, I'm talking about upperly mobile suburbs and private schools. That's not the norm either. Right. right? So that subsection is still the minority of the population. Yeah. It's probably a majority of our listeners but it's not the you know, because podcast listeners in general are much more highly educated mm-hmm. and their income is higher. Right. So it's probably a majority of our listeners, but it's not majority of the, of the population. Right, right. Yeah. I think okay. we, I said five minutes ago, we beat it up like a drum. <laughs> now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are up to the big nine, eight, nine, eight, 98. And we talked about EFC last week, and we said we'd be coming back and talking about it again this week. Uh, this week, we're coming in from a different perspective. The name of the chapter of the book I wrote is called, Why Does My EFC Say I Can Pay Such an Outrageous Amount of Money? Anika, you've read the chapter. What are your thoughts? What were your takeaways? Well, what I took from this was that, again, that the EFC can be high because regardless of your salary, there are your real life expenses that are not calculated in the formula or in the federal formula. Uh But I got to tell you, Mark, the clarity that I received from this chapter was not so much about how much the EFC can be, but more importantly, that we should know that the EFC is the minimum that you should expect to pay. And what brought that home for me, of course, was that great example that you give with the college or you took a scenario of the the cost of a college, the family's expected family contribution. You factored in, okay, then you add the awards given by the college and then you add in the loan provided by the college and then you added in the amount of a campus job, you know, that was in that package Mm -hmm. and that there was still a gap amount there, even with the loan and the job. Mm -hmm. So that was my biggest takeaway. Okay. Yeah. So there are several other things that I wanted to emphasize in this chapter and writing it and in our discussion here. There's so many reasons why EFC, which is an acronym for Expected Family Contribution, which I despise, although I have some good news I'm going to share at the end of this conversation about that. And so let me just mention some of them. One of them is the fact that EFC does not look at bills at all. And so a lot of people have bills. And if you have debt, then 
you know, there's no way in the world when you look at your EFC, you're going to feel like I can afford that amount of money. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's not looking at your student loans. It's not looking at your mortgage payment. It's not looking at your credit card bill. It's not looking at your auto loans. It's not looking at any of that. But those are real. If you got a four or $500 uh, car note and then you, you know, you got a $500 credit card bill and I mean, student loan, I mean, all that, those are real bills that take away from your discretionary money. Doesn't look at it at all. It strictly looks at income and assets. So that's the worst reason why most people feel like they can't pay their EFC. But there's another reason, and this is really great. I'm going to read this. This is a quote from financial aid guru and expert Mark Kantrowitz, who you know we've I've talked about several times. I've considered him the person who's taught me more about financials in college than anybody else, and we'll be having him on our podcast. But let me read what Mark says. So the actual formula used for calculating EFC is flawed. According to financial aid maven Mark Kantrowitz, it is based on a budget for a family living a lower standard of living in 1967. <laughs> okay, Anika, that is like, uh, you know, oh, wait, 1967. Is. You said that budget has been adjusted. You said the budget has been adjusted for inflation in terms of EFC, but not for changes in family spending patterns. He said there's no room in the formula for things like HBO, cell phones, internet access, Nintendo, Wii's other modern luxuries nor has it been adjusted for necessary expenses such as dramatic increase in healthcare costs. Hmm. So that's one of the reasons why the majority of the time when I work with a family, when they look at their EFC, they're like, how in the world do they think I can pay that? Hmm. They, it's, it's a joke to them. You know, it may come in, it might say like 90,000, and they they really feel like anything over 40 would be like really hard for them. Or it comes in and it says like 24 and they think like anything above like 10 is pushing. Like, you know, no matter where they are, the most common reaction to people's EFC when they see it is, who in the world do they think they're talking about that I can pay that amount of money? So I just want to kind of explain why that number is so inaccurate. We've talked about this before, even most recently, the federal form that doesn't look at cost of living. That's a problem. Hmm. You know, if you live in places like Manhattan or Los Angeles or, you know, Palo Alto and many, many other places in the country, Boston, Connecticut, the cost of living is so much higher than a place like Tennessee. And it's not considering that. Now, we talked about this last week. There's two EFCs. The profile EFC can look at cost of living, but it makes a 20% adjustment. And these places can cost three times the amount to live. Like there's a, a website I used to go to a lot. See if I can remember it. It's like, bestplaces.net. It's really, I think I got that right. I'm pretty sure. You know, and Anika, you go to this website and you put in any zip code and you put in your zip code and you can put in like, if let's say you put in um, $100,000 in where you live mm -hmm. and it will tell you how much money you need to make in that zip code oh, wow. to have the exact same lifestyle. It's really fascinating. Oh, it is fascinating. So, yeah, yeah. Because I know, like I was doing that a lot when we moved here because when we moved here from Westchester to Fairburn, my expenses went way down, you know, because mm -hmm. Westchester was like 20% above the average and Fairburn was like 18% under the average. Okay. And I remember doing this with uh, New York City. I punched 50,000 in. It was like 141 in Manhattan for the exact same lifestyle. So all of that's not factored in. It's crazy. Not by the federal formula and by profile formula, only a 20% adjustment. It's a joke. Then there are other things that are a joke. Let's say you're working with a uh, religious-based family, and they really believe in giving like 10% in tithing, and that's like their, you know, spiritual commitment, and they believe that's what God wants them to do. There's no adjustment for that. There's no school that makes an adjustment for that. That is seen as an arbitrary decision that you did, and that's a lifestyle choice that you made. Well, that's a lot of money. I've worked with a lot of families like that. Hmm. You know, I worked with a family like that from Manhattan not too long ago. So they already weren't getting the cost of living adjustment from New York. And then they were regular tithers. And the income was over 200. But by the time you take New York into consideration, and then you take over that 10%, and the school was like, I'm sorry, that's your decision. Hmm. And then here's another thing. If you have your kid in private school, I'm not talking about the kid going to college. I'm referring to a younger sibling who is still going to be in a tuition-charging private K-12 through school 
while the older student is in college. Okay? Let's say you got your kid in private school and you're paying twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. I mean, talking about K through twelve. So FAFSA formula doesn't take that into consideration at all. Uh, profile formula can, but a lot of schools don't do it. And most of the schools, you know, I, I ask schools this when I meet with financial aid directors. These are the kind of questions I ask them. And the most I've ever heard, and I'm talking about the wealthiest, wealthiest schools in the country, the most I've ever heard a school tell me that they will decrease from your discretionary money for having a kid in K-12 private school is $12,000. Hmm. So what if your kid's at a $60,000 boarding school and you're paying sixty grand? The best that they'll do is punch in 12000 So now where are you getting the money from? <laughs> so you see, there's like, I could go on and on and on and on and on. And one of my pet peeves, and I just have to say this, is how schools handle home equity. And this is why this process is so complicated. Because I've had three conversations in the last six months with very, very, very wealthy schools. I can't mention who they are. Or I'll just say one was an Ivy. One was a highly selective liberal arts school. And one was another national university that competes with Ivy's. So very, very, and these all, and all these schools have crazy large endowments. Uh, and a meeting, and two of them were lunches, by the way. So I'm in a very casual cordial, warm, relaxed. It's not like me coming up to somebody like buttonholing them when asking one question after a presentation. Like, this is like a relax, we're laughing. And then I wanted to know what their home equity policy was. Because if I'm working with families, I need to know what the home equity policy is if I'm trying to position the family for money. Because some schools count all of home equity, some count none. If I have a family with a $600,000 of home equity and you're counting, do you know what I mean by count all or count none, Anika, or not? I don't. Okay, so... For the profile, home equity, meaning the amount of money you have in your home, right? The equity in your home, mm-hmm. will increase your EFC. All right. So they will use it toward your EFC. In other words, they'll say, okay, you have money there. You can tap that money and take out either a home equity line of credit or home equity loan and pay for college with that home equity. Okay. So I need to know the policy because there's some schools like the Harvards and Sanfords and Princeton's that don't count home equity at all. And then there's other schools that count every dollar of home equity. So if a family has $600,000 in home equity, now they're going to ask you to pay an extra about $33,000 just off your home equity. So you're going to be expected to have to tap into that. And in these three conversations with these three people, they would not tell me their home equity policy. Hmm. Uh, Because I would say, you know, are you like 1.2 income, two times income? Because usually it's capped according to income. They're like, they are like, well, two of them said, well, kind of something like that. That's what they said. <laughs> and, one of them, and one of them said to me, we don't reveal what that is. Oh, wow. And that's what bothers me is that this process is so opaque that if I'm trying to get the best financial bargains for my families, here are schools that won't even tell me how they're using home equity to increase EFC. Mm. So for all of those reasons and many others, and if we kept going on, it'd be an hour just on this, so I can't keep going on. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length, Usually, it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes, it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that $5,000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Oh, there is one other thing I want to say before I get to the news. By the way, another reason why families feel like they can't pay their EFC is it's not uncommon, Anika, for schools to take 45 to 47% of each $10,000 in a raise. So let's say, you, let's say I'm working with a family and they make $130,000. Mm-hmm. 
let's say they get ten thousand dollar raise to that's the family income. I mean, that's if you have two income workers, that's not you know that could just be seventy and seventy each, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say each, like husband and wife each make they go from making sixty five to seventy, so now they're making one forty. So they got a ten thousand dollar increase in pay. Do you know that the EFC formula is not uncommon after taxes? So take taxes off that, take the taxes away. It's not uncommon for them to ask for forty five to forty seven percent of that money to go toward college costs. Mm, that sounds insane. Anytime you have something that almost everybody feels isn't fair, you have to expect it's not fair. If I teach a group of students, 30 kids, and only five of them understand what I said, the problem is not with the students, it's with me. I didn't explain it well. And that's how this thing is, right? So like over 80% of people feel like, I can't pay that. Maybe even 90% that will feel that way. Hmm. And one of the reasons why is because if a family goes from making, I'm just making numbers up, 70,000 to 170, there's no family in the world that lives the exact same way at 170 as they live at 70. They just don't. But the formula almost expects you to live like you're still at 70. But every single family will be spending a little bit more on clothes, on food, on maybe a car, maybe vacations. And the formula almost expects you to be living that same Spartan lifestyle that you lived when you were making 70. So anyway, I I know I'm going off a little bit too long, but you can probably hear my passion. Yeah. So I want to say the good news. I'm going to get a lot more into this later because I'm going to do a segment on this. But there's some legislation in Congress right now. And this is an example, actually, of the Democrats and Republicans working really well together. So Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, and this is his last year, and he's been very passionate about education. He wants to go out with a bang. He's working with Doug Jones from Alabama. And they are hoping to get something through. And it looks like it has a chance. I'll be talking, like I said, a lot more about it coming up in future weeks. But one of the changes, Anika, is they are proposing we get rid of this term EFC. And we're, we're going to replace it with a term called student aid index because they've heard from everybody, stop saying that this is the my expected family contribution when that number is ridiculous. So at least there's some positive movement in terms of the terminology. Oh, and how does that really, is that just, I mean, the, the methodology <laughs> is going to stay the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that opens so... up a whole can of worms. I know. So, like, you're like big whoopee doo. Right. Like, remember, whoopee doo. Like, they changed okay, the name. And? <laughs> they still ask me to pay 60 when I can afford 20. Mm-hmm. What big deal, right? So, I think it's a start. It's a start. At least it's a start in an acknowledgement that that number is completely disconnected from what families can actually pay. Okay. And it's a start. It's going to put a lot of pressure on schools because those 78 schools that claim they meet full demonstrated need, now, that's always been like a, a prestige and a badge of honor that they've worn. Like, yeah, we're in the club of family of schools that are more generous than the others, even that the EFC is a joke. Now, what are they going to do? Hmm. Is going to force them to say, well, you're going to work off of an old number that really never was meeting family's need? Stop saying you meet family, meet full need when we're not saying that the EFC is stands for what a family can contribute anymore. So I think it should lead to the start of positive things. Okay. I respect baby steps. Yeah, it's a little, <laughs> little, it's like toddler steps. <laughs> but, you know, but but it, I haven't had any movement on this in decades, so I'm, I'll take every little crumb I can get. We'll take it. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, this week's question comes from Miss Kelly in Maryland. Kelly in Maryland. Her question reads, how do boarding schools prepare students for college? And you pause so, for a reason. <laughs> yeah, so I pause because Anika knows me so well. And, and I said, when, just before we came on, I said, Anika, you know I'm going to ask you to answer this question because <laughs> you've had two kids that have attended boarding school. One who's a senior, one who's graduated. And what made you select boarding school? And what did you feel you got from boarding school? Mm-hmm. And so I'll let you answer it. Then I'll chime. Obviously, I did boarding school admissions for nine years. Mm-hmm. I do boarding school college placement now. I'll chime in with a few thoughts after you share your perspective. So here's the thing, Lamar. I think it's what's really important, like the way we should set this up, is that there are excellent schools in categories, right, that prepare mm-hmm. our kids for college. Right. And what I mean by that, in a high-quality way. You got charter programs, you got magnet programs, you got private schools, you got 
for us, boarding was one of those options. Yeah. Now, it's certainly a much less considered one because, mm-hmm. I mean, we would have had an inkling of a clue about boarding school had we not been introduced to you. Right. You know, in our charter school middle program. Mm-hmm. So it's really about the experience. Right. Like, so, you know, do I want a large school? Do I want a small school? Do I want more exposure? Do I want less exposure? Do I want to be diverse? Do I want not to be diverse? So, I mean, listen, parents, we're always looking for and advocating for school systems with greater resources. And with boarding, mm-hmm. you're talking about institutions with deep pockets. So for us, I think it was just more so it's not about we didn't go into boarding school saying, okay, how is this going to increase our chances? And I'm not sure this is exactly her question in terms of increasing your chances of preparing for college or just how does it do it? Because it goes back to the point of this is just another high school. It's just it's an option. So for us, for, you know, Jalen and Janae, it was, it was an adventure for them. They got all excited about it. You know, we researched with you for a couple of years with Jalen. So Mm -hmm. it's, I feel like the question is posed in a way, and I could be wrong, but I feel like it's posed in a way of, okay, what is that, what's special going on over there that, you know, they're really going to boost your chances of college? I don't know. That's just the way I take it. So. Yeah, well, you know, and I'm glad that you started by mentioning you certainly do not have to go to boarding school to have great college options. mm -hmm. I mean, there are only 39,000 students in the country that go to boarding schools. Okay. One out of every 500 kids goes to a college prep boarding school. So we thought before where we said only one and a half percent of students are going to these schools that take under 20 percent. Well, only one out of 500 go to a college prep boarding school. So I'm glad you kind of set the table with that. Mm -hmm. I know from I had some correspondence with Kelly from Maryland back and forth a little bit. She's considering college. She's considering boarding school for kids. So she's looking at it from that perspective. Like I'm considering a college prep boarding school, you know, how does it help with college prep? So I think we should answer her question. Mm-hmm. I think it's good that we said you don't have to do it, but I think that well, we should and it's answer not even and, and it's not. I don't want to say that the answer is you don't have to do boarding school to get college prep. I think it's more so you approach it in the form of okay, what do I need for my school, regardless if it's in my neighborhood, if it's three miles away from me, or if it's four hundred miles away from me. What's the curriculum like? What is the rigor of the program? What is the experience that I want my child to have? What is the community like? So all of those things everywhere in a high quality fashion, prepare your kids for college. And that's what boarding school does. Now, for us specifically, it was, I think, well, I'll speak for me and not for Javon. One of the most attractive pieces about the boarding school experience was that for me, it was going to set them in an environment where the kids were very much like them in terms of Uh their academic profiles. Uh Like, you know, I feel like you increase your chances of getting into an environment with very like-minded individuals. Uh Was that all about college? Not necessarily. It was just about, Uh we weren't even really thinking about college, honestly, Uh when we were, you know, going through the boarding school process. So it was about how were we educating our kids at the time? What kind of resources were they going to have access to? Plenty, right? There were so many Uh experiences in the boarding environment that we would have never been able to provide had they not been in that environment. So does that prepare you for college? Absolutely. The exposure to different cultures, you know, the access to different trips and programs and, you know, just all the things that they would have, if they would have gotten that, you know, in our neighborhood, that would have been fantastic too. And the fact that being in a residential environment, obviously that prepares your kids for college because, you know, it's just like being at college. You have a roommate, you have, you know, responsibilities to um, you be accountable for, you know, a lot of things. So I don't know. Did I answer it a little bit more? Or? Yeah, you actually did. And so I want to say a few things, but you hit on a lot of the main points. And so I love that you used the word exposure mm-hmm. because to me, that's what I emphasize with people when they're interested in boarding school. Right. Is there is an element of exposure. Oh, so when right. I worked at a boarding school that I did, we had 13 different countries on the soccer team alone. Mm-hmm. And so people are in the dorms with those kids, having meals with those kids. And so they're learning all about those different cultures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, first I wasn't going to answer this question, Anika, I'm like, you know, we're about, we're, we're a college admissions boarding, college boarding, college, <laughs> we're a college admission, I'm all confused over here, <laughs> Gee, college admission podcast. But this question has come in at least three times, maybe even four. And so mm-hmm. there is an interest out there for people to know about it. So I don't want to, don't want to blow people off. Sure. So there's also a different model of teacher. So the teacher Mm -hmm. at a boarding school 
is someone who you are having meals with. They're taking you on trips on the weekend. Right. You know, there's a required study hall from 7.30 to 9.30. The teacher can be working with you one-on-one on your, you know, mm-hmm. your pre-calculus or your oh, linear yeah. algebra, whatever it is. And so it's a different model of teacher. Teacher is more mentor, even friend, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And I will share a story. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of make a little bit of the positive case for boarding, and then I'm going to talk about the other side. Okay. So Dr. Childers, you can look him up. He's arguably the world's foremost World War II scholar. He's a professor at Penn, uh, UPenn, right in Philly, Ivy League school. He's been there for over 40 years. So he showed up one day in our office, mission office, walked in, came out and greeted him. He's very right to the point. He said, listen, at that time he had been at Penn for 30 years. Now I think it's like 43 or something like that. He's been there forever. He said, I've been teaching at Penn for 30 years. He said, I can tell the students that went to boarding school before they Mm self-identify. He said, and that's what I want for my kid. And so I proceeded to talk to him a lot more. He said, they participate in class the most. Mm -hmm. He said, they seek me out in my office. And that comes a little bit from boarding school. In boarding school, you don't have a teacher, the professor just teaches and leaves because you're having meals with them. They're with you on the dorm. They're coaching you. When I say with you on the dorm, like they're on dorm duty, making sure you're not acting a fool, like, you know, chicken. Mm -hmm. And and so it's not acceptable to just have someone platoon in and just teach and then leave. So they come and get to know them in the office hours. So, yeah. So he enrolled his daughter, Ava. She was a complete rock star for us. Tour guide head. And she followed him, went to Penn. That's the positive side is the acceleration of your maturity because of the exposure. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, there's such a stereotype out there, right? The perception of boarding school is you got a dysfunctional kid, (laughs) you're bad parents, delinquent parents. And I know you've had some of that, Anika. There's no way in the world you could not have parents say, you, what's wrong with your kids or what's wrong with you? There's some strange looks. I bet you got your stories. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, you got your stories, and I could keep people up all day with stories. I'll, I'll tell two really quickly. Uh, I was visiting the Coey family. They're in the Bay Area of California. Both of them actually had met at West Ham where I worked, and they both are doctors. One is a professor at San Francisco Medical School. Another's got a good practice out there. And they sent all four of their kids back to the school. And so I was talking with them. I was having dinner at their home, and they're like, Mark, I was telling this family that Youngest daughter is about to go to boarding school. And she looked at me with this look. How could you send your kid away? She said, you could have just emblazoned on my forehead. Bad parent. Oh my God. You know, yeah. Bad parent. So there's a perception you got to deal with. There's this, this other fan. I'm not going to mention this name. But there's another student. I worked really hard to get this kid admitted because she wanted to come so badly. And then I reached out. Great news. You're admitted. They said, guess what? We're probably not coming. I'm like, what? <laughs> and they said, they said that I had a parent come right up to me right in front of my child and say, all these years, I thought you had a good relationship with your child. I thought your child was well-behaved. Like, <laughs> I didn't know there were problems going on. So, so she said, now my kid is feeling the stigma. Oh so there's God. some issues. You got to deal with that because the mm-hmm. public perception is, is very different right. on when it comes to that. But the one thing, I, let's talk about the college prep piece because that's really a lot of the question, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. There are positive aspects of the college prep. These are some of the best college counselors that you'll find. They've come from college admissions to college counseling. Mm -hmm. The ratio of students to the class is usually like 30 to 1. So there's a lot more individual attention. They know kids really, really well. So Mm -hmm. the recommendations are very rich and deep because they know you. I remember when I was doing college counseling at a boarding school, and I had a highly selective school come up to me. I was working with a, a multicultural student. And the counselor and the admission officer from this highly selective school said, Mark, we could go to Bronx. We could go to Harlem. We can get the valedictorian. But we don't know if they can live away from home. We don't know if they can live in a predominantly white environment, predominantly white, wealthy environment Mm -hmm. that's residential. But they've already done that with you. So if something was going to go wrong, we figure you like our testing ground and we could see through the recommendations and the grades that it would have gone wrong with you. So we'll take a kid from you that doesn't have as good of a grade. Plus they trust the curriculum because they know there's rigor. So there are some aspects of college prep that you get in that environment for college prep, but there's the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is, and this is where things are trending is schools talk about diversifying more and more and more. They're diversifying away from taking so many kids from the private schools. Because back in the day, headmasters just had handshake agreements 
with the schools and the places like the Exeters and the Milton sent a ton of kids to Harvard and the Hotchkisses sent a ton of kids to Yale. I mean, I worked with this, a parent who went to Milton Academy and she sent her kids to West Ham, both of her kids. And her graduating class at Milton, Anika, 43 kids went to Harvard in her year. Oh my goodness. Her year. Wow. So that's how it used to be. So it's not like that anymore. The schools are diversifying. And they're saying, we don't want all these kids coming from this one, you know, strata of American society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're diversifying. And what the colleges are increasingly saying is, I know you were in an environment that was harder academically. And so I know it was harder to get an A there than it would have been at your local public school. But guess what? Too much is given, much is required. I cannot tell you how many times I've had somebody say that. And so we expect more from you because you've been given all of those resources. Right. And quite honest, and so honestly, I believe the worst reason to go to a college prep boarding school is because you think you're going to get in a better college. Right. Because you're going to have to have, it's going to be harder for you to get a 394038 and stand out as one of the top kids. And you are going to be compared because schools read by school group. Mm -hmm. And so the bar is higher. So to go because you think you'll get in a better college I see all the time kids that go, you know, let me just stop because I, I could talk for hours and hours on this topic with <laughs> stories. And I have so many stories. And so I don't believe a good reason to go is because you think you'll get in a better college. Yeah. You should go for the exposure if you're interested and you should go for the personal growth. Right. But while there are college prep advantages, the bar is also higher because the most elite schools want you to be at the top of your class no matter where you go. Right. And not that her question was asking about mm -hmm. how to get into a selective college, right? Going to boarding school. Well, she's also, so she's asking about the college prep aspects of things. Mm -hmm. And what happens with kids that I work with, Anika, is they'll look, and I'm going to name names here. They'll look at a place like a Phillips Exeter and they'll say, oh, gee, 13 kids went to Harvard, eight went to Yale, whatever. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a lot. We haven't sent a kid to Harvard in five years at my school. So my chances would be a lot better, it seems to me, if I go there. But what they don't realize is, one, you just put yourself into an applicant pool where everybody that's there is in the top 2%. I mean, not everybody, but the average kid is in the top 2%. So it's, gonna, it's super hard to stand out when you're in that applicant pool. It's going to be, are you going to be able to go there and get mostly A's? That's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Secondly, a lot of kids that are there recruited athletes. Okay, so a lot of those placements you see are recruited athletes. A lot of the placements you see, this is our very, very wealthy communities, are people whose dad could write a check for to build a new building, and they got in either through that or the colleges. Now, this isn't true as much as the highly selectives. They, we've talked about this before. There's a preference for a lot of schools if you're full pay. Mm. Okay, we don't have to use your, our financial aid, so you got a benefit of being full pay. The fact that because there are so many wealthy families. Colleges visit there because they know they will find families who can pay and the colleges need money. So you do get more face-to-face -face access to admission officers at these elite boarding schools. And these schools recruit the top students of color all around the country. So these top students of color that have now been in this environment that's more like the colleges, they're extremely attractive. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the college, you can't look at the college list and think that's going to be you. So it's deceiving. That's what I'm trying to say. I think we answered so, it, Mark. I think we talked it out. <laughs> I think we answered Kelly's question, I think. Clearly, we have so if many not, stories to share, but. <laughs> oh, I have so many stories. And I only stopped because I can't do a two-hour podcast. I mean, I can't. We already have the, you know, Anika, we're the only college podcast in the country that gives more than, in the world, actually, I've looked this up, that gives more than four hours a month of new content. And we give six. Oh, wow, look at that. We're already doing six hours of, <laughs> and when there's weeks, where there's five weeks in the in the month, we're doing seven and a half. Mm -hmm. So we're already doing, giving more than three hours more content per mm -hmm. week than any other college podcast in the yeah. world. But we don't want it to go like double it. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to do that. So, Kelly, good no, luck so to your good. child. And, yep. you know, if you decide to yeah. go to board it or not, happy to answer any other questions. If you want to sidebars, you know, send me an email through the, your college bound kid questions, whatever. But, yeah, it's it's an option. It's a definite option. It's a great option. Yeah, and I will say this. Uh, in another life, not that long ago, it was like 2016, I did a whole documentary <gasps> oh series on boarding <laughs> Remember that, Anika? <laughs> You've done so freaking much. <laughs> I can't keep up. I did. I did. A, I became producer, director, and I did a six-hour 
documentary. Got a really nice email from St. George's School this week in Newport, oh. Rhode Island, saying they love the documentary. And Jalen so, is in there. Oh, my God. I forgot. Yeah, Jalen is in there. Jalen is in there. Her son. Oh. Um, you're in there, Anika. I sure am. <laughs> you are. So if anybody wants, is are very interested oh, in goodness. a documentary series on boarding schools, a six-hour series. Although there's five documentaries, they're like an hour and 10 minutes each, the whole five or six hours. Mm -hmm. Just go to a secretworld.org and you can indulge all you want on boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to college. Back to college. Okay, friends, we are on part two of a three parter with Emily Griffin at Amherst College on the Career Center. In this part, Emily's going to talk about is there a demand in the job world for students who get degrees in things like history, English, and philosophy? Emily will share the top skills employers are looking for. She'll talk about how you can evaluate various career centers as part of your college admission process. And she'll talk about whether you can trust the statistics that career centers put out there about the percentage of students that get a job after six months. Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. But let's talk about what a lot of parents say out there. A lot of parents are like, I don't want my child majoring in the humanities or the social sciences, yeah. things like English or history or philosophy or the arts. These are dead end majors that lead yeah. to the unemployment line. I mean, engineering, computer science, business, nursing, that's where the jobs are at. So from mm -hmm. your experience, you know, Emily, is there really a demand for people who do not have more specialized degrees? Yes. You have to keep in mind that I'm looking through the lens of Amherst College, which is a liberal arts school without specialized degrees. We certainly have degrees that you might say are more practical, you know, like STEM degrees, you know, computer science, etc. But really the whole school, you know, is liberal arts, not applied skills, not technical training, certainly nothing vocational. And through, you know, through my lens, you know, the employment outcomes of, of students landing in jobs after graduation is sky high. So, but we also have to keep in mind, you know, that Amherst has a bit of a, you know, a name brand and a reputation with a lot of organizations. But in general, you know, there are always going to be some fields where you do need a specialized degree, like nursing, as you say, or something like mechanical engineering. And, you know, liberal arts students who pick those fields will need something like a post back year, which is, you know, one year of intensive accelerated study after graduating from a four-year program or additional schooling to catch up. But, you know, the downside to those very practical degrees is that when there's a tectonic shift in the economy or in technology, which I think we all know happens and it ha it's happening with greater frequency and it's very hard to predict, mm -hmm. it can be really hard to reskill or to adapt um, to suddenly what the job market is looking like, suddenly what jobs exist and what jobs do not exist. And it can be really challenging when you've trained for something that's really tied to a specific job function or a specific industry even. And the classic liberal arts majors and, you know, STEM, STEM is a liberal art, you know, the STEM mm -hmm. disciplines are among them, but things like right. philosophy, history, English, literature, they're actually the most versatile. And you need to kind of make a, a little bit of a mental leap, like past the first few years of a career to think about that. But, you know, those disciplines, something like philosophy, something like history, certainly English, they teach frameworks for thinking, for critical thinking, for synthesis, you know, taking a lot of complex information, distilling it into something that people can understand, problem solving, creativity, being able to research. But really above all those are um, communication skills, especially writing. Written communication skills, uh, along with problem solving skills, are the top skills employers are looking for. So people coming from those disciplines are actually highly desirable to employers for those reasons. And then, you know, they just have the benefit of also being really adaptable when suddenly a huge new technology blows up or suddenly, you know, we're in a recession and job functions completely change or become obsolete. Those skills can still be applied to something completely different. So let's get really tangible and I'll use sure. an actual situation, a real, this is a real situation 
family I'm helping in Alabama right now. Yep. The mom has said to me, my daughter loves history, but she can't major in history because how is she going to make a living with a history degree? Yeah. So if she was talking to you, yeah, can you give examples of, you know, people with history degrees and some of the type of opportunities they have? Or how would you answer that question here? I'll just let, leave it open-ended and see what you say. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of ways to go. I mean, I had a student from Amherst several years ago who majored in history, wrote a history thesis. But she also studied computer science. So there's one way you can go is you can major in what you care about, but also at the same time, acquire some of those practical technical skills that are more immediately marketable right after graduation. So she also mm-hmm. studied computer science. She did a lot on her on the side on her own, you know, to develop those coding skills. And mm-hmm. she's been working in a tech company in San Francisco since graduation. But the thing about her having the history degree and that training is that a few years into her career, you know, she's a lot more versatile. She's more capable of progressing in her career and eventually out earning her peers because she can see the big picture. She can make connections. She can think and write at a different level because she's had all of that fantastic training from doing the research, doing the analysis, doing the writing you know, for her history degree. So in the long run, the history degree is actually what really makes the difference. I have an alumnus who's been on my advisory board for a couple of years who was a, he's been a higher up corporate strategy for a financial services firm for a long time. So very senior guy in finance and he double majored while at Amherst, he double majored in English and in math, I believe. No, it was English and economics. And I asked him what skills, you know, from his education really propelled his career, really made it take off. And I I really expected him to say something about economics. He said that that actually had no mirroring whatsoever, that the English degree was really what made the difference for him. It made him stand out among his peers. He was more lucid. He was more fluent. He was, you know, able to communicate big ideas in exciting ways and made a bigger impression, um, you know, in his work environment and was, you know, had more creativity, had more kind of long range strategic thinking ability. And so, you know, I've, I've heard that time and again from our alumni and from our students. So, you know, I think one strategy is majoring in what you really care about but also thinking about technical skills that you might want to be acquiring along the way that are useful, especially in the very short term after graduating. But also, you know, there, I think I read the statistic that it was, I think over like a third of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies have liberal arts degrees. It's actually very, very common in business, in organizations, you know, for profit, not for profit, to actually have degrees like history. It's, it's very common. It's totally marketable. It's what really makes the difference. Again, and I'm a little bit obsessed with internships, but it's really true. You can major in history, but you can have internships and in organizations during your summers or depending on where your college is, you know, during your semesters where you're demonstrating that you do apply skills that you're learning in college, in the workplace, that, you know, your resume proves it that you've delivered projects, that you've made contributions, that you can talk about those, that your supervisors can vouch for you. Those are the things that actually make you marketable and employable. So I think you can, yeah, you can major in history, you can major in philosophy, you can major in art like I did. But if you make good use of those times when you can have an internship and be in an organization, that's actually what's going to get you hired after graduation. Yeah. And there's plenty of studies that show that most people are not working in, you know, a yes. field directly related to their major. And I'm sure you probably heard Mark Cuban, you know, come out the owner of the yep. Dallas Mavericks and say liberal arts is uh, where it's at for the future. That's the skill that's lacking. It's, you yeah. know, not to say people shouldn't do STEM because they absolutely should. But oh, I think sure. we've overcompensated with this focus on, you know, you have to have a, a technical, practical degree right away. And I think that that extreme is out there. And That's one of the reasons we wanted you on here. So I want to ask you a question because I can see somebody listening and thinking, you know, you're making a real compelling case. I really see value to this career center, but how can I as an applicant evaluate a career center? 
Hmm. If I'm looking at my colleges and this, you know, I don't want to spend quarter million dollars and come out unemployed and work living in my parents' basement. Absolutely. And so, and I'm sold on the fact that the career center is going to be an integral component in determining whether or not I, you know, can catapult from this education to a great opportunity, whether it's through all the services you've enumerated already, as well as others. So how can I evaluate a career center, even in the admission process, maybe even to decide what schools go on my list or which schools I decide from when I'm picking between three or four or five options? Yeah. So what can you share there to help our listeners, Emily? Sure. Well, I do a lot of panels and presentations for prospective families. So I get a lot of questions and I get a lot of questions about, you know, what you've asked, you know, can my child build a successful career, you know, if they stick with a discipline that they're really passionate about, or should they do something that seems on the face of it more practical? You know, the really good questions I've gotten that I think really zero in on evaluating career centers are how much do alumni help students? Mm -hmm. And that can happen in a lot of ways. So, you know, I think before I talked about it primarily through the lens of alumni want to hire students from their alma mater. How much is that true? And how much do they work with the Career Center to help students access internships and jobs in their organizations? That's certainly one dimension. But then there are other ways that alumni are really helpful. Some Career Centers have really terrific ways of connecting alumni and students more in a mentoring capacity. So, you know, do they do that? What does that look like? It can look like a whole bunch of different things. There's no one right way to do it. But, you know, you just want to be looking for a career center that is actively engaging alumni. That's basically what it boils down to, because that's always going to benefit students and give them an edge. So can you give us a couple questions that a family should like? do, Do you recommend families visit career centers as part of their tours? Do you recommend they try to follow up with the career center after the tour? Like how, Yeah, I don't necessarily think a tour guide may know the answer to this if they just ask your average tour guide. Oh, I think that's a great point. Yeah. So what questions should a a student or parent even ask? And who should they ask? And when should they ask in the admission (laughs) process? I know I'm asking you a lot, but I I know these are the things that our listeners are thinking right now. Well, that's good for me to understand. Absolutely. And you're right. Tour guides are not going to know this level of information. They might know some broad strokes that are helpful. I think that you can get a sense from tour guides as to how much enthusiasm they have for the Career Center. Um, They're going to tell you. And what they're going to tell you is, you know, it's going to be a bit of a litmus test about how their peers interact with the Career Center. You want to see high rates of engagement with the Career Center. So you can get a little bit of a sense of that from students. I think the best way is to directly ask staff members at the Career Center. So either you visit during your tour, you know, if if that's appropriate and available to you on that college campus. Almost every college during open houses you know, during kind of open house weekends, we'll have panel discussions where they include folks from across campus Mm -hmm. to talk about their different departments. Um, If they don't have somebody from a career center, that's a red flag. That should definitely be part of it. And I think that that's a really great forum Mm -hmm. for asking those kinds of questions. I expect those kinds of questions in those forums all the time. And I come prepared, you know, able to tell parents um, and prospective students, you know, basic stats. You can get some basic information directly from admission offices. Admission offices should be able to tell you directly, you you know, without even having to go to the Career Center. They should be able to give you information about postgraduate outcomes. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 98 is the Department of Education's College Affordability and Transparency Center. Now, the URL is collegecost.ed.gov. The website is chock full of unbelievably helpful information when it comes to the cost of college. For example, instead of jumping around to every college's net price calculator on their website, you can come to collegecost.ed.gov and they have links to every college's net price calculator right here at this one website. The best way for me to explain this site is that it is a portal that will take you 
to the other amazing websites that the Department of Education has that we have featured on other recommended resource segments, including some of my very favorite college admission websites like College Scorecard, College Navigator, College Financing Plans, State Appropriation Information, and so much more. If money is a concern to you, then the Department of Education's College Affordability and Transparency Center is a must website for you to bookmark. Do you feel those stats are reliable? Because I I see some stats and that some of them look amazing. Like yeah. 94% of our students have, yeah. you know, work in six months and that yeah. kind of thing. And and I also know stats can be manipulated. I mean, is work working at Starbucks? That really wouldn't be what yeah. people have in mind if they've dropped a quarter million dollars. And I sometimes wonder if that mm-hmm. sort of thing gets into the stats because obviously yeah. people want the stats to look good. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I think Trusting the stats. No, I think you're right. I think the stats can definitely be manipulated in that way that they're not showing you a more granular level of detail in terms of, you know, what do you consider employment that's kind of worthy of the degree, you know, six months after graduation. Uh, Some Mm -hmm. schools, you know, including ours, are starting to layer in more meaningful questions in our surveys. You know, Mm -hmm. are you employed in a job that gives you traction towards your professional goals or that Mm -hmm. gives you meaningful growth opportunities that you value? You know, questions like that. Um, And I Mm -hmm. think those are much more revealing But again, you know, those stats are just focusing on six months after graduation. You know, I I was twisting in the wind six months after graduation. You were in Barcelona till 29. (laughs) Yeah, I was having a great time. But professionally, (laughs) you know, really adrift. But I was building my skills and I was becoming a more experienced person. The person that was then capable of doing, you know, what I did once I really kind of caught my wind. So, no, I agree with you. The stats... You want to look at the stats, but they certainly don't tell the whole story. There's really no replacement for being able to ask questions directly of career center staff. But the kinds of overall contours that you can be looking for, in addition to postgrad outcomes, you can ask admissions offices, what is the rate of alumni engagement with the college? That should be something mm-hmm. that they know. You can ask them, mm-hmm. is there support? Is there a support or a funded internship? program? Is there support for unpaid internships if my child had an unpaid internship during the summer? That's a huge gauge of has the college invested in supporting internships or not. And it's just a yes or no question. Is there support for that or not? And again, the admission office should definitely know that. You can look at the staff size. You can look on a website Mm -hmm. um, for the career center and do about us. Look at the staff. And if it's a you know, a college that has 4,000 students and there are only five people in the career center, you know, that's a little concerning. To me, that would not look like a ratio that could really handle either, you know, the the volume of one-on-one appointments that should be happening at a college of that size or the bandwidth to do things that are more proactive and creative. They're probably a pretty reactive career center. And again, not the fault of the professionals working there at all, but just a matter of is the school prioritizing this as a resource or not. So you want to see, you know, a a good sized staff. You want to look to see, do they have a pre-law advisor? Do, you know, the advising staff at the career center, do they have differentiated job descriptions where somebody is focusing on employer relations and then somebody over here is focusing on med school advising and then somebody over here is focusing on first year advising or however they've organized it. If you see a small staff and they all seem to be doing a lot of different functions, they're probably pretty overtaxed and they're not really going to be at the level where they're doing all those nice extras that really, really make the difference. So in your opinion, what's a good, because I I love that thing about size, staff size. Yeah. So if you're a student and I'm sure you're looking at it in, in relation to the size of the graduating class. Yeah. What would be a number that, you know, a student should feel comfortable with? Let's just say for, you know, yeah. if you could give some guidance. And I know you probably don't want to be, I know there's always exceptions and, you know, it's probably, always. <laughs> but if you could give some general guidelines, like if, if you were a parent yeah. and you were looking at a school for your child and you wanted to make sure their, their career center was good, of course, you didn't really know how to evaluate one, but from a, just the whole ratio to staff, what would be a number that you would be like, you know, I can, I think I can work with that. 
Yeah. Well, I can't give you a ratio because I still struggle with math because I did study printmaking. Uh, <laughs> 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 that I that's usually a politically correct dodge, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm working with an Excel sheet, you know, it's, I'm really, really, uh, I really struggle. You know, I'll, I'll give you some examples. I mean, you know, I think Amherst has a particularly well resourced career center. It is by no means. They have you, they better. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> we have about 19 people, and we have. Oh, that's good. Yes. And we have a student body of. 1850, roughly. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty high ratio. That's, you yeah, know, that's, that's like almost 100 to 1. Okay. Well, that's for the, for the whole student, whole student body. That's even like 25 to 1 is, if you look at seniors. Yeah, if you look at seniors. Yeah, well, right. And, you know, and that's the other thing that this is a little harder to gauge if you're trying to evaluate a career center. But I will say what is really important for career centers to be doing now is having a way to work with first year students and with second year students and not just focusing their services on seniors. So you really, that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why having a bigger staff is important because you're not just thinking about that senior class, you're thinking about all four years. So you really do. And need that was my next question. Oh, you okay, just, great. Like, perfect, great segue. Yeah, no, <laughs> perfect segue. Yeah, I was going to ask you, when should students start using the services, current students yeah. at the Career Center? And then my part two was, how should they use the services? Is there like, is there some a different recommendation you would have for a freshman versus a mm-hmm. sophomore or junior? And I know there, I know this is a question that I encourage people to ask. Not all career services are really that open to freshmen seeking them out. So that's always an indication right there, right? But that's, what are your thoughts yes. on that? You know, and, and I think it's interesting that you just said that. To me, having a way to engage first year students is so critical that it's almost kind of implicit for me now that I forget that that isn't always the case. And it should definitely be Mm -hmm. something that if you have the opportunity to ask further questions, other than the kind of research that I talked about that you can probably do on a website or by talking to admission staff, it's really important for students to engage with career services as early as possible and often. As early as possible really is different for everybody. Some students just cannot do this in their first year. Everybody has a different lift. Mm -hmm. Adjusting to being on a college campus is so complex. You know, it's social, emotional, academic. Some students are just not ready Mm -hmm. to have those conversations in their first year. And they're certainly not ready to think about professional development related internship their very first summer. And I think that's fine. I think what's most important is mental health. And so we're all going to be derailed if if mental Mm -hmm. health is not prioritized, right? So that really is my main priority for first years. But I think you by the way for saying that because we've talked a lot about mental health. Have you? You know, we have a recommended resource every week on the podcast and we went 10 straight weeks where we had a mental health a resource, a book, a, you know, webinar, something just because of the, the chronic problem out there. It's just really yeah. bad right now. And, you know, yeah. and then maybe even more so at highly competitive schools, but it's just overall, yeah. it's just really challenging. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. So I would love for first year students to meet. It's in some way to have some kind of an interaction with our career center but it can be really low stakes. It can be a conversation that is just, you know, reflection, exploration, maybe doing one of those personality assessments, you know, different centers do different ones. Mm -hmm. We do the Myers-Briggs, which is super, super popular. We do Strengths Finder, Mm -hmm. which is also really interesting. It really doesn't matter which one it is. Mm -hmm. The point is that it's a jumping off point for just some reflection and conversation about who you are, what you're interested in, what you value, what you don't, and just demystifying the career center, you know, realizing that people who work in the career center, you know, nobody does this work unless they're motivated by human development and Mm -hmm. helping people grow. So they're typically pretty happy to see the students and pretty warm and pretty accepting and really non-judgmental. So, you know, I love that first step of just getting comfortable, knowing that it's not scary, maybe getting a few ideas and a few insights 
I would at least love if people start there. But certainly by sophomore year, I think it's really important to be working with an advisor in a career center that is starting to be a little bit more planful. Because at that point, you have two summers before you graduate in terms of internships. Mm -hmm. And at Amherst, we're remote. I mean, in terms of our geographic location, we're not really plugged into any major city. We don't have you know, really great public transportation to take us into any nearby city. And so we do not really think or talk about internships during the academic year. That will be different mm-hmm. at other schools, obviously. So mm-hmm. we, we really think in terms of, you know, you have three summers to have opportunities that help you explore different fields, help you make a few connections that might help you with that postgraduate first job. And so by the time you're a sophomore, you know, you have two of those summers left. And so at that point, I really do think students need to be planning for their second summer being something that it doesn't have to be the thing that helps you get the job after college, but it should just be something that you're trying out. It's fairly low stakes. You try it out, you come back, you hate it. That's a really great Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I love it when students come back from a summer and they say, I hated my internship. It's like, well, this is rich Mm -hmm. material to work with. This is great. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's how I'm better to find out now than at 30 when you hate your job. You feel stuck and you got kids and it's either uh, suck it up for 35 years or spend a lot of money and do online or night school and go back and get another degree. So good thing to learn it now. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So that's, you know, I, I feel pretty passionately about that. I think it's really important. So again, it's up to parents to figure out how to balance that in terms of knowing where their students are and and how they're feeling and how they're adjusting to college and balancing that with a little bit of encouragement (laughs) to just get involved. But I do think that it's important by sophomore year to be, be in there. And so therefore, you know, when you're looking at career centers, for me, with my child, I would want to know what are they doing to engage with first and second year students? Are they really just focused on the senior year or have they really expanded to think about Mm -hmm. the entire student experience through all four years? That's whatever I can find to indicate that they're thinking a lot more broadly uh, would be really important. Next week in the news, as students struggle with stress and depression, colleges act as counselors. It will be in chapter 99 of 171 Answers, and we'll talk through what you need to know about the very important FAFSA. And next week's question is from a mom asking if applying to only one school is a bad strategy if the student applied through early decision and would be notified in December. And Mark concludes this interview with Emily Griffin in the final part of how you can evaluate and fully utilize a college's career center. Friends, our college spotlight of the day is the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And from now on, I will just refer to it as UAB. For one, that's way too much of a mouthful to say every time. And second one, because nobody, and I mean nobody, calls them the University of Alabama at Birmingham. They're just UAB. And they are often confused with perennial football power, University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. That's the Roll Tide School. This is not the football school. They're often confused with the University of Alabama at Huntsville. Those are completely different schools. I've met with admissions officers from all three of them this fall, though, and they all have their unique strengths. I plan on doing college spotlights on all three. But for the next several minutes, it's all about UAB. Before I get started, Anika, did any any memories at all? You said it was your nephew went? Yeah, but I don't have any memories. I just know he went there. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you visit him when he was there Unfortunately, or not? I did not visit, clearly. <laughs> okay. okay, that's okay. Hmm. Just, thought I, just thought I'd try. So UAB is in downtown Birmingham. And Birmingham's a city with over 200,000 people. And Birmingham, it's more progressive than other parts of Alabama. So before I moved to Atlanta... You mentioned Alabama, and I'm sorry, I'm going in the opposite direction because I knew my civil rights history. And Birmingham was bombing him to me hmm. from the civil rights movement. And I've been there the, twice now to the Civil Rights Museum in Birmingham, and I'm really impressed with how Birmingham is changing. And it's arguably the most progressive place in Alabama. So, you know, before I said I was going to come back to how important mission is, when, when in our missions tip was mission matters, mission determines that mission. And I said I'd come back to that. So I want to read to you UAB's mission statement. Then I want to break down why this is so important. So there's their mission statement. UAB serves... Oh, Anika, I'm going to ask you if anything stands out to you when you hear this mission statement. So UAB serves students, patients, 
the community, and the global need for discovery, knowledge, dissemination, education, creativity, and the application of groundbreaking solutions. We are a leader among comprehensive public urban research universities with academic medical centers. Anything stand out? Well, the patients, obviously, in the medical center. Oh, you are right on point. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things I thought you would, I was hoping you would say. Mm, Got it. You are on it because how many mission statements talk about patients? Right. And how many mission statements focus on their medical centers? Hmm. And right in the mission statement, you can see the heart of UAB. That was good, Anika. (laughs) If you reverse that around, I would not have got that. If you would have done it to me, you're a good listener. That was really, (laughs) that was really good. Yeah, so let me read it one more time. I want you to listen for that this time. UAB serves students' patience. I'll jump ahead. I won't read all of it. And then at the end, we are a leader amongst public urban research news with academic medical centers. So why is that so important? It's important because UAB has five branded hospitals on their campus. Five branded hospitals. Mm. Okay, they are known as the medical college for Alabama. Wow. That's where people go. For Alabama, you go to UAB, and um, it's only 100 blocks. So if you're someone who likes like a smaller, tighter type of campus, then that's going to be UAB. Now, it's still got the green spaces. So it's an urban campus with green spaces, but it's 100 acres. It's a tight campus. And you can start your shadowing with nurses and doctors right in your freshman year. Mm. So right away, they get you into those hospitals, working in there. They just built a new $40 million addition to their nursing wing, brand new simulation labs, mannequins, new study rooms. They're a nursing powerhouse program. And I often will refer my nursing students there. Over 300 students graduate every year with Bachelor of Science in Nursing, which is the top nursing degree you can get. We're not talking about an LPN or an RN. If you want to know more about that, we did a deep dive onto nursing in episode 57 in our interview segment. But one-third of their students do research on campus, in labs, and in hospitals. This is a school with 13,000 undergrads and 8,000 grads, so 21,000 overall, but 13,000 undergrads. They are also known, in addition, because they're not only medical, right? It's not just medical, even though that's where they're a powerhouse the most. They also have some strong programs in business and computer science. Those are some strong programs that require internships for anybody that does computer science. They have 120 majors. They're really trying to put a more of an emphasis on their business program so that they're not only known as the medical school. Brand new business facilities, Colet School of Business. Some of their strong majors there would be finance, marketing, management, accounting, and real estate uh, would be strong. And they have specific business scholarships. They're really trying to attract more and more students interested in business. They have a really cool thing where they'll help you launch your new business if you're an entrepreneur. And so there's a lot of funding and support to help you with your business plan if you're interested in entrepreneurship. Another strength is musical theater, neuroscience, and Birmingham's a little bit of an art center. Hmm. Yeah, so art studios are cool. Now, they have their own app. You apply directly to them, or you can apply through the Common App. It's only a $30 application fee. It's a real simple app, no essays, no recs, and they are using just test scores and grade point averages to admit. Minimum, you need at least a 275 GPA or 20 on the ACT or a 1020 on the SAT. Now, those are cutoffs. Those aren't averages. And that's right around the national average, by the way. And you can a little bit under the national average. So pretty much need to be at the national average to get in. Rolling admissions. So as applications rolling in, decisions rolling out, usually within two weeks from when you apply, you hear from them. They don't have early decision. They don't have early action. Just rolling admissions. They do offer merit-based scholarships, and they're automatic scholarships. So your admission app becomes your your scholarship application. They have some additional ones you can apply for, but some of their more generous ones are automatic scholarships. And they will stack them. You remember what stacking was, Anika? We talked about stacking. Do you want to ask me that? Because I was like, ooh, stacking. I remember that word. (laughs) (laughs) Darn it. I'm going to remember soon. Stacking, piling up. (laughs) You know what? We got the really, really, really hard one today. (laughs) That mission statement question, when I said, I said, I'm asking you really, this is really hard. I'm saying it really fast. How in the world are you going to know it jumps out and you got patient? I mean, I was so impressed. Oh my goodness. Um, I can't remember stacking, stacking though. Ah. Stacking <laughs> is like combining. So you can combine, they can, so you combine multiple scholarships together oh, from the okay. same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they'll combine their automatic scholarship with the specific one you apply for. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about their money in a second, because one of the things about them that's so great is 
how affordable they are. So diverse, they're extremely diverse, and they really pride themselves on their diversity. 58% white, 26% black, 6% Asian, 3% Latinx, 4% biracial. As far as racial diversity, they're not as diverse geographically. 89% from Alabama, 11% from everywhere else, although they do have 100 countries in the student body. Once again, a lot of people are coming there because, you know, they're really strong dental school as well on the grad school side. 60% female, 40% male, high acceptance rate. So this is an example, again, how you can't look at a school with a high acceptance rate and think that it doesn't have high standards. 92% acceptance rate, which is high, but don't think that that means they're taking everybody. 75% of students have over a 375 grade point average. So three quarters of people have a 375 or higher, and their classes are small. 65% have 29 or less. So you're going to be in small classes. And 83% have 49 or less. And then the last thing I want to say is they are affordable. So for out-of-state cost of attendance is 43000 Out-of-state everything, all included. And then there's scholarships. So if a student has a 30 to a 36 on the ACT, 1360 to a 1600 on the SAT, you're going to get 18 grand automatically for their Blazer Elite. Hmm. And if you have a 26 to 29 ACT or 1230 to 1350 SAT, then you're going to get 12,000. You'll get their Blazer Gold Scholarship. And if you have a 24, 25 ACT, 1160 to 1220 SAT, you can get their Blazer Pride Scholarship. You just have to have a you know, higher GPA, which is $10,000. Mm-hmm. So super, super affordable, unless you are a Pell Grant recipient or a really under-resourced family. Aniko, any thoughts on UAB? Well, I did go to my nephew's graduation, and I was— I thought you said you didn't go. No, I never visited him, like, during while he was oh, there. Oh, okay. I, but, you, but you made it to the campus. Yeah, I made, oh, yeah, for sure. And it was I was actually surprised. I was pleasantly surprised. I'd never been to Birmingham, and it was beautiful. I was just like, oh, my goodness, the campus itself is beautiful. But he had a great experience and he actually, he got a job right out of, you know, he's in Dallas now. He got recruited into a company at Dallas. I think it's General Motors or something. I don't know. Was he in the medical field no, or was he business? he was at what business was school. He was management, okay. something, something, something. Yeah. But he's doing really well. So kudos, UAB. I mean, it's really a bargain. I mean, I mean. Mm-hmm. Well, that I didn't know, but yeah, it is great. Yeah. I mean, you look at their cost of attendance and you look at their automatic merit scholarship money. And when you see how high, you know, so students that go into nursing have to take something called the NCLEX test. Mm -hmm. Their NCLEX pass rate is extremely high. Mm -hmm. And look, anybody can look up, look up their dental school. It's one of the top in the country. So anybody interested in a medical field that doesn't want to spend an arm and a leg, that would like to be in a city that wants to be able to get involved in doing internships and things right away, it's an excellent, excellent option. And so I'm really, really excited about you a, B. Me too. I'm glad you could chime in and have the little relative. That was a nice little add-in. I wasn't expecting. <laughs> Old Tyler. Tyler Will. Shout out, Tyler. Woo-hoo. Shout out, Tyler. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenbaugh. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.